so let's talk about where things are at. Uh, this photograph was taken on November 5th uh, as Trump attempted to declare victory in an election that he has clearly demonstrably lost. This is, uh, this is what we would think of in the photo journalism industry as Pulitzer fodder. Uh, this is the kind of photograph that wins you prizes just by simply standing on the edge of the um, uh, White House press room. And you know that this person had this angle worked out probably years ago and finally had the opportunity to snap, the, kept it secret for years, and then finally just snapped the photo that all of us kind of needed. And indeed, it is true that Donald Trump lost the 2020 presidential election by a considerable amount, and we'll talk about that uh, how, just by, by just how much um, in a moment. But that that we are in a situation in which Trump has lost the presidential race. There is zero chance of his uh, legal pursuits successfully finding the hundreds of thousands of votes in at least three states that he would need to overturn this election. Um, and yet he is openly declaring himself to be the winner. And in so doing, not only fueling conspiracy theories but doing what in the end may, be, may prove to be irreparable damage to our democracy on his way out the door. And so this is a dangerous moment. Now, I am not gonna lecture to you today about how I think Donald Trump um, is trying or will successfully pull off a coup d'etat. I don't think that he will. I am still convinced that Joe Biden will be inaugurated president on January 20th, that this will all eventually find its way to some kind of resolution. But every day that Donald Trump remains in the White House denying the fact that he lost is doing ongoing damage to this country. And the evidence for that um, was on the streets of Washington, D.C. this weekend. And I, I want to sort of talk about some of those things. But we should also make note, um, as if it were something that could easily be evaded or escaped, that the United States is in the midst of the most rapidly accelerating phase of the pandemic in our history. It has been how, you know, it's been since uh, February and March that we have been suffering the uh, impacts of this disease, and they are only getting worse. It has been five months since Donald Trump attended a, the pandemic task force meetings. He is effectively denying the existence of this pandemic and it is rapidly accelerating. You can see the charts here. We are well into a third wave with the, the arrow pointing asymptotically upward, uh, accelerating well past 150,000 cases a day. It's estimated that we will be at more than 200,000 cases a day, uh, possibly by the end of the week, with a 15-day lag between uh, inset cases and hospitalizations and deaths. We are going to rapidly see the death rate from coronavirus uh, spiral well beyond 1,000 deaths a day, which is what its current uh, rate is, uh, well upwards to uh, 2,000 deaths a day plus. Hospitals in places, particularly the upper Midwest, are already overrun with this disease. Um, and we will see increasingly uh, the breakdown of our healthcare system. And this is all uh, headed in the teeth of not just winter, um, but Thanksgiving and the Christmas holidays uh, in which Americans would expect to be celebrating with friends and family in which we now know that the single most effective means of spreading coronavirus is either in eating in an indoor restaurant or having dinner parties with friends in intimate spaces in, inside, which is exactly what is about to um, uh, wash over this country. So we have every expectation that not only is the crisis in our democracy about to worsen, but so too is the coronavirus almost in uh, lockstep. Uh, so this kind of context has to be acknowledged. The, the, the tragedy that is actively unfolding before our eyes is something um, uh, that is, is difficult to comprehend. It's truly a, a difficult to comprehend. Um, now, let's just talk about the election returns for a moment here. These, this, uh, you may have seen this meme floating around. I think it's a solid visualization of just how much Joe Biden actually managed to win the presidential race by. Um, but also, it, this is the national popular vote, of course, but that Biden at this point has won um, 
and will win the presidential race by be, at this point 5.4 probably 5.5 million votes one of the largest margins of victory in um, in American history it's truly historic uh, he you know has won the electoral college with exactly the same reverse tally that Donald Trump won by in 2016 something that Trump referred to as a, a shellacking a landslide something of historic proportions you know the man's propensity for hyperbole well, he lost by exactly the same amount that he claimed to have won by. So add whatever adjective uh, feels appropriate. Biden's win of over 5.4 million votes and counting is equal to the combined population of at least six U.S. states, Wyoming, Arkansas, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Idaho. Those six states were one quarter of the states won by Donald Trump and constitute but 1.7% of the U.S. population. Yet at the same time, the 19 electoral votes of those six states equals 3.5% of the electoral college. So the radical irrepresentative nature of our democracy remains a frontline issue. Similarly, we all know that while the presidency has been essentially decided by the voters and will soon be confirmed by state legislatures in the electoral college, the United States Senate remains very much up for grabs, and that is control in Washington, whether Mitch McConnell will be able to block every conceivable law passed by uh, the House and desired by uh, Joe Biden remains very much to be seen, and will hang on a Georgia runoff on January 5th. Now, Vox News over the weekend ca calculated that if Republicans win in Georgia, the Senate Democratic minority will represent 20 million more people than the GOP majority because of the imbalance in the United States Senate in which Wyoming has two senators and California's 55 million people have two senators. Now, if the Dems win and the Senate is in a 50-50 balance with uh, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, deciding the balance in the Senate, the Dems will then represent 41 million more people than the Democrats and have a 50-50 representation in the Senate. So the radically undemocratic nature of the American government remains very much on display. Um, you know, it, it is true that the Democrats very much underperformed on down ballot races, but even um, in this circumstance, 41 million more voters in the Democratic mi majority uh, in the Senate than uh, the Republicans, and yet it could end up 50 50 in those races. Now, over the weekend, um, CNN and everybody else has effectively filled in the electoral map. Uh, North Carolina was called for Trump. Arizona uh, and Georgia have been called for Biden. Uh, and this is the finished electoral map. At the same time that the national media has decided that you know Joe Biden is the uh, president elect, that the most state election boards have determined the winner of their states, Donald Trump has spent the last several days tweeting things like this. Uh, so this, while I was composing this lecture last night, Donald Trump just dropped his bomb of "I won the election!" full you know exclamation point. Um, to which you know someone like. Um, you know, it's, you know, I won the Powerball, I am Iron Man, you know, I mean, like, just fill it, you know, feel free to tweet whatever nonsense you want. Um, and it, it's, it's good for a joke, but it is, in fact, quite dangerous for the President of the United States to be behaving in this way. Um, this, the second tweet you see here, he won because the election was rigged, is the closest we've gotten so far to Donald Trump admitting that Joe Biden won this election. He won, but it was rigged. Now, of course, there is... I mean, I, I shouldn't have to say this, but I will just to be on the record here. There's exactly zero evidence of massive voter fraud. None, none at all. There's one or two cases that they have found, um, you know, in Pennsylvania, some Republican uh, voted, uh, you tried to use his dead mother's ballot, um, things like this, right? Two, three votes, four or five votes. Most of the lawsuits that Trump is filing in these states are being thrown out uh, with laughable lack of evidence. Um, this, this is done. You know, this is done. It has to get through and all of it has to be certified. But Trump insisting that he that this election was a scam, that he has been shafted, um, that that all of this was rigged uh, is the damage being done in the current moment. And it has led to um, 
a number of really startling consequences. Now, elections are always turning points for both the winners and the losers. And we spent a lot of time last week talking about how now that Joe Biden has won, a civil war sort of broke out inside the Democratic Party between the progressives and the centrists, between Rahm Emanuel and AOC. And they're at each other, you know, trying to fight over, did progressives cost the Democrats or did the, the progressives win things for the Democrats? And that debate is gonna continue to go on. Lesser considered by us and others is the break, the outbreak of civil war inside the conservative movement or inside on the right. And I'm going to spend most of today talking about the far right. Um, there is a pronounced and accelerating schism on the right that is articulating itself through right wing media. And it begins on election night when Fox News called Arizona for um, Joe Biden. Now, it is unusual that Arizona got called by the, the, the decision desk at Fox, because in the end, Arizona was the closest in terms of, I think it was only a 12,000 vote difference. It's the closest of any of um, the major swing states. And yet Fox called it on election night and insisted on it to the point where Trump and Jared Kushner and others were calling executives at Fox News. According to press reports, Jared Kushner was on the phone with Rupert Murdoch himself, the owner of Fox, the, the New York Post, the, um, uh, the Wall Street Journal, like big media mogul, right? The, the, fa the Australian right wing tycoon that owns uh, global right wing media. And, Kush, and Rupert Murdoch essentially telling him, you're done, guys. This is over, call it, up, and you're done. This has led to a profound schism inside of right-wing media to the point where Fox voters are, um, excuse me, Fox most loyal viewers are fleeing the network and moving to more right-wing media outlets like Newsmax, OAN, and others, and, re and returning to online sources. At the same time, Twitter and Facebook, unwilling to be blamed again for helping subvert democracy as they were accused in 2016, have tried to take a much more proactive attempt at uh, combating disinformation on the internet. And so every major tweet that the president puts out, so this one, I won the election, you can see here with a link that says official sources called this election differently. <laughs> so Twitter is basically saying the president is lying. And it, while everybody more or less lies on Twitter, um, these some lies are more damaging than others, of course. And so this being seen as a damaging lie, Twitter is attempting to uh, frame. Uh, at the same time, Facebook is cracking down on news on sites and um, Facebook groups that are attempting to push the conspiracy theory that this election is being stolen. So what you see here is, uh, sorry, is a, a website that um, a, a Facebook page called Stop the Steal, and the red line through it means that Facebook has canceled that they've they've eliminated this site and others. And what we've seen in recent days, starting on election night, is a mass migration of right wing. Um, Facebook outlets and Twitter feeds onto new sites, in particular a site called Parlay, a parlor. Um, you know, I. I Parlay would be the French version, but somehow I think that they're probably not going to pronounce it in the French version. It needs to speak, right? Um, they're probably not using the French pronunciation. So I'm going to say parlor. I, I don't, I don't know, but they're migrating to this new bastion of free speech. And so this is, you know, as parlor is the most prominent free speech social media in the world, which means free reign for racism, white supremacy, neo-Nazism, and um, you know, and the, the entire sort of uh, right wing conservative establishment is attempting to abandon Facebook. Now, Facebook traditionally has been a right wing media bubble in which uh, really amplifying right wing voices throughout the election season. And now that Facebook, Twitter and other and Fox are committed to the reality that Donald Trump lost this election, we're seeing a fragmenting of the right-wing media scape and the right-wing movements. And people are moving to websites that provide them with the facts such as they imagine them to be that they want to hear, which is to say that this election is still up for grabs, that if we fight, and particularly if we pray really hard, Donald Trump can still win this election. I personally, the chances of this at least, you know, are, are non-existent, but yet this is what's growing on the right. 
Um, Fox News itself has broken out into a full-scale civil war internally between the news division, which runs during the day, and their primetime stars, uh, namely Hannity, Ingram, uh, and Tucker Carlson, who are all deeply committed to the conspiracy theory that this election has been stolen, that this is a massive fraud committed against the American people, and that Donald Trump will eventually come uh, to prevail. Whereas poor Chris Wallace over here, uh, the head of the news division at Fox, has to insist that Joe Biden will become the 46th president of the United States. So Fox has broken itself, has broken in half into open internal civil war on Fox News uh, as they attempt to address the question of um, how do we grapple with the fact that Donald Trump lost this election. This is a very serious uh, concern for them. They're losing audience share. Telling the truth is losing Fox its audience full stop, right? Telling the truth is losing Fox its audience. Now that I think, you know, it tells us something really quite dramatic about the kind of alternative reality that most Trump supporters find themselves um, living in. Now, what you see, you know, the, in this space then is the massive expansion of conspiracy theories. Um, that we see within, particularly on the far right, driving these kinds of this, um, this, this insistence that Joe Biden did not in fact win the president, presidential race and that it's only a matter of time before the authorities um, find a way to make Donald Trump president. So as Trump, you know, here's the New York Times uh, tries to cling to power of uh, fans, uh, fans unrest and conspiracies. Now, Conspiracy theories have long been an essential feature of American political and intellectual life. They are um, they, they have been present in the United States since the very beginning, um, in which um, it, it's argued by someone like uh, Bernard Balin here, the great colonial historian of the United States, that it was indeed a conspiracy theory of British attempts to subvert the freedom in the colonies that led the American Revolution to set off in the first place. A fear of foreign subvers subversion, a fear of foreign intervention led American patriots to um, uh, uh, create a new nation. Uh, so as to prevent these European conspiracies from subverting um, our freedom. That, so in a sense, the idea that conspiracy theories have been present from the origin of the United States, and they're indeed quite foundational uh, to the ways in which we think about and understand politics. Um, this has only become a greater and greater problem over time. And at the middle of the 20th century, one of the great theoreticians of paranoia and the conspiracy theory and conspiracy conspiracy theories in general is that of uh, Theodore Adorno, a, a Ge German-born Jewish intellectual who fled the Nazis in the 1930s and came to the United States. Uh, actually, lived in Pacific Palisades for a number of years during World War II, if you can believe, um, you know, the high modernist German Marxists living uh, in Pacific Palisades. But there they are. And Adorno uh, did a study in the post-war era called the Authoritarian personality with a number of other, uh, indeed UC Berkeley psychology professors, in which he writes, quote, all modern fascist movements, including the practices of contemporary American demagogues, have aimed at the ignorant. They have consciously manipulated the facts in a way that could lead to success only with those who were not acquainted with the facts. Now, on the one hand, the absence of facts is indeed where a lot of conspiracy theories kind of grow from, right? in the sense that these, these theories fill the vacuum uh, of ordinary American ignorance or ordinary ignorance, when people don't understand things, when society or the systems of meaning or, or history, society, culture, politics become so complex that um, people simply are uh, incapable of understanding, making sense of it all. And indeed, none of us are really capable of making sense of the totality of complexity that is our society, our history, our civilization. And so many people choose to grab onto the simple solutions that connect fact to fact to fact in quite tenuous ways that constitute conspiracy theories that are enormously attractive because of their explanatory capacity, especially when systems of meaning and society overwhelm the individual. When we feel dwarfed by reality, when we feel are incapable of understanding what's going on in the world around us, and we feel disempowered 
um, we feel victimized by this flow of human history, the tendency is to grab onto conspiracy theories that help us explain not only our sense of powerlessness, uh, but where in fact things are going and how power actually operates. Now, in the middle of the 20th century, the most important expressions or theory, theorizations of conspiracy theory come uh, particularly starts, in fact, on the day after, or excuse me, the day before the Kennedy assassination. November 21st, 1963, the Columbia University historian Richard Hofstetter gave a talk at Oxford University that he entitled The Paranoid Style in American Politics. It then went on to be an essay in Harper's Magazine that you can see here, published in 1963, and then went on to be the lead essay in a, in a very important, significant book. Um, I don't have a copy with as cool a cover as the one um, you see there, um, but uh, called The Paranoid Style of American Politics. Now, for Hofstadter, um, the paranoid style evidenced a kind of what he called a, quote, state of mind found in social movements throughout US history, evoking the qualities of what he called, quote, the qualities of heated exaggeration, suspiciousness, and conspiratorial fantasy. According to Hofstetter, quote, the central precept preconception of the paranoid style was the existence of a vast, insidious, preternaturally effective international conspiratorial network designed to perpetrate acts of the most fiendish character. The paranoid style in Hofstetter's examples does not simply fixate on devious crimes or political plots, but claims knowledge of an explicitly totalizing variety capable of explaining the whole of society and history. The political paranoid believes in a quote, vast or gigantic conspiracy that is the motive force of historical events. History is a conspiracy, writes Hofstetter, sat in motion by demonic forces of almost transcendental power. And though he makes no claim to offer a clinical definition of paranoia, this is Hofstetter, he does describe the paranoid style as evidence of what he calls a political pathology that appears to be, quote, all but ineradicable and has a greater affinity for bad causes than good. Now, Hofstetter's argument, explicitly pathologizing largely right-wing social movements, and indeed he writes in 1964-65 about the Goldwater movement, which he calls the pseudo-conservative revolt, and the rise of the John Birch Society, particularly far-right version of anti-communism um, that was quite, very much on the kind of, it came out of the Southern California far-right, the Orange County far-right in the 19, uh, late 40s and 1950s. Now, these are largely right-wing social movements that helped intellectuals uh, shape the kind of, Hofstetter's argument uh, about right-wing intellectuals helped shape what we think of as mid-20th century American liberalism, merging the traditions of an anti-fascist European critical theory, particularly Adorno, um, Herbert Marcuse, um, uh, uh, who am I thinking of? Eric Fromm, a number of others, right? The Frankfurt School of American, uh, of German, then exiled German uh, critical theory, merging that with the kind of anti-communist Cold War American pluralism that was dominant in the middle of the 20th century under the names of people like Daniel Bell, David Brian Davis, Bernard Balin, Seymour Martin Lipset, and others. These are prominent political scientists in the mid 20th century. Now taken together, this approach was referred to as the consensus school of American historiography or pluralist political science. And together they came to believe that it, it create a cultural history around the fears of a predominantly nativist, anti-Semitic and xenophobic mass movements employed uh, by an explicitly pejorative political psychology. And so they sought then to argue, right, to, uh, to, to analyze this political psychology, this mass psychology that is dependent on conspiracy theories to explain uh, the world. Now, the effect of this is then that Hofstadter and others came to argue that the paranoid style exists on the margins of American politics. It exists on the fringes, on the edges, right? These are, these are not mainstream ideas. These are wackos, lunatics, they, oh, what, they, they're paranoid, right? This kind of paranoid, this kind of pejorative psychopathologizing of political ideologies and beliefs. Hofstadter came to believe that the price we paid for a free, liberal capitalist society was to tolerate 
the intolerance of the margins. So if there's paranoia on the margins, that is the price we pay for what Arthur Schlesinger will call the vital center, the coherent, rational, capitalist democracy of American mid-century liberalism. Now, in this sense, right, this is a kind of theory of American exceptionalism, that our democracy can withstand the onslaughts of these paranoid nabobs on the outside. Now, despite the enduring influence of Hofstetter's essay, and it is quite enduring, indeed, Paul Krugman writes at least two columns a year called The Paranoid Style of X, right? This is, you know, you'll you just look it up, type into the New York Times, The Paranoid Style, and you'll get at least a dozen Paul Krugman uh, columns that will just pop up because it's quite, you know, a common argument, right? The paranoids are on the fringe. We hold the vital center. Now, the problem with this, right, its most obvious flaw as a piece of political theory also provides perhaps its deepest insight, namely the conspiracy theories, especially right-wing conspiracy theories, do not exclusively populate the extreme margins of American politics or history. Rather, the most dangerous conspiracy theories in American history, in American politics and history, emerge from the very center of political power itself, in which the white supremacist, anti-communist and anti-terrorist ideologies, each defined by shifting fears of subversive conspiracies, are promoted and enacted by presidents, business leaders, military men, judges, prosecutors, police, and vigilantes. The greatest source of conspiracy theories in American political history are not marginalized groups like the populists or 9-11 truthers or even QAnon, but the centralized authority of the state itself anti-communism, anti-terrorism, right? The existence of the FBI, the CIA, the Department of Homeland Security, the national security state are all grounded in state-oriented conspiracy theories of subversive enemies, right? That have to be contained, rounded up and destroyed. This question then has been comprehensively articulated by, uh, theorized by the political scientist and former UC Berkeley political scientist, Michael Paul Rogan, as what he calls the counter subversive tradition. Rogan's body of work, beginning with his seminal critique of Hofstetter and pluralism with the intellectuals and McCarthy, oh, here we go, that's Hofstetter's, excuse me, Rogan's body of work, offers a theory, uh, a history and theory of what he calls political demonology to call attention to quote, the creation of monsters as a continuing feature of American politics by the inflation, stigmatization, and dehumanization of political foes. The horrors of what Rogan calls the, quote, dream life that so often dominates American politics are easily listed as they shape our national identity and have periodized our history. The India, and this is Rogan again, the Indian cannibal, the black rapist, the papal whore of Babylon, the monster Hydra, uh, United States Bank, demon rum, the bomb throwing anarchist, the many tentacled communist conspiracy, the agents of international terrorism. Such fears are promulgated not by uh, fringe extremists, but by presidents, political candidates, newspaper editors, and business leaders who came to come to name the subversive enemy, attach personal anxieties to political projects, and to direct the repressive apparatus. Quote, the demonologist splits the world in two, writes Michael Rogan, attributing magical, pervasive power to a conspiratorial center of evil. Fearing chaos and secret penetration, the counter-subversive interprets local initiatives as signs of alien power. The counter-subversive needs monsters to give shape to his anxieties and to permit him to indulge his forbidden desires. Demonization allows the counter-subversives in the name of battling the subversive to imitate his enemy. Now this is why the Ku Klux Klan dresses in papal vestments, why the John Birch Society organized itself in anti-communist secret cells, why urban police behave like street gangs, why democratically elected conservatives hate government, why Islamophobes adopt ISIS terror tactics, and why this weekend we saw the Million MAGA March 
in which far right wingers adopt the language of the Nation of Islam's 1990s era Million Man March, in which we see them, uh, the far right, adopting left wing chants. The streets are streets, this is what democracy looks like, so on and so on. Why far right wing movements often adopt the idiom, language, appearance, and tactics of the left that they claim to oppose. Part of it is because they don't actually have any ideas of their own. They see the left as decidedly successful in being able to build movements, but in organizing against the left, they adopt their strategies, tactics, identities, uh, and slogans. Um, so also in the words of Theodore Adorno, again, quote, those who persistently blame others for indulging in conspiracies have a strong tendency to engage in plots themselves. And so what we see though in this moment is something quite unique. And these tweets, I think, kind of sum it up, right? This one I, I showed you, he won because like, the, and then I think this other one here is probably the most dramatic. Of all the mechanical glitches that took place on election night were really them, all caps, them, right? Now, when we think about the language of paranoia and the pronouns of paranoia, them, they, right? It's this mysterious them. It's a mysterious they. It's always those folks that are doing this kind of the deepest damage, right? Them getting caught trying to steal votes. They succeeded plenty, so on and so on. In a sense, this is what Trumpism is. Trumpism is when the paranoid margins conquer the counter subversive center. When the paranoid fringes actually win a presidential election and take over state power. Now, because Trump came from these paranoid margins, and again, remember, Donald Trump rose to political significance because of birtherism, through birtherism, the conspiracy theory that Barack Obama was not born in the United States. This was his <laughs> primary contribution to political uh, to his political rise. So this is a man who's always been engaged in fringe conspiracy theories, who successfully took over the state, and in so doing has been waging a kind of war against the actually existing counter subversive elements within the government. Namely, Trump has been at war for four years with the FBI, with the CIA, and with the Pentagon. And which is why Trump replacing the head of the Department of Defense, this, uh, you know, immediately after an election is both troubling and very much, um, you know, par for the course for this man, right? Uh, now, what, what that means remains very much to be seen. I personally think he replaced the head of DOD just out of vindictiveness um, as, as a kind of immediate punishment. I don't think this is, um, and I just, this is another asterisk. I don't think that this is evidence of a plot of a coup d'etat. I don't, I think if Donald Trump tries to see, you know, seize power, or what have you, the, the United States military will not go along with him. That's really what it comes down to. And Saro, you spoke of this quite eloquently earlier, that it's really a question, is the army going to go along with him? And I, I don't think they will. But what do I know, right? This is all to be. This is all in the future, um, and yet what this shows us is that conspiracy theories actually operate on a different level right now. And this is where I, you know I will admit I was just reading from my own book, but this is where I, I do want to talk about my own book very briefly, which is a history of conspiracy theories and conspiracy laws in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, particularly conspiracy laws um, as attached to labor unions and labor laws. Um, the first use of conspiracy laws in the United States were designed, were used in the Philadelphia Cordwainers case in the early 19th century uh, to ban labor unions as criminal conspiracies. Um, uh, labor, uh, excuse me, not monopoly capitalism. Um, monopolies were defined as a conspiracy in restraint of free trade. Um, <clears throat> the, the conspiracy laws have been perennially and historically used against social movements. Indeed, the conspiracy laws in the United States offer um, a mirror image of the laws of incorporation. So that when social movements, unions, um, socialists, communists, anarchists, um, African-American freedom struggle um, organize themselves as social movements, as collectives, they often face a surplus legal sanction under the use of conspiracy statutes by which they are often prosecuted for crimes in which guilt by association, hearsay, a whole series of legal loopholes are um, available to state prosecutors to destroy social movements. At the same time, the fiction of legal corporate personhood provides the modern business corporation with a surplus legal benefit in which the collective and conspiring 
corporation is treated as a fictitious legal individual. So they are granted a surplus legal benefit. And so the mirror image between the conspiracy laws and the laws of incorporation mirror each other in the late 19th, early 20th century in ways that we are still very much living with. But it's important to think about um, when we talk about conspiracies, Right, what we're talking about is not just some whacked out theory, you know, the tinfoil hat man with the this type shit, right? This, these are QAnon charts, right? About how like the grand QAnon conspiracy works. This is the tinfoil hat, you know, Hollywood conspiracy theory mise-en-scene with the strings, you know, like this is what, that's what this is, right? But in the end, what conspiracies are, are that it's a crime. Right, as Clarence Darrow famously said in the early 20th century, the civil liberties lawyer Clarence Darrow famously said that um, if a boy steals some candy, he gets a slap on the wrist for as a punishment. But if two boys make a plan to steal some candy and don't do it, they've nonetheless committed a felony, which is the crime of conspiracy. Often plotting a crime, it carries a greater legal sanction uh, than even carrying out the crime itself. Right. So this is a, a legal space in which collective action is rigorously criminalized. But if we think about conspiracies, right, and here I give you the, the, the definition. I mean, literally, conspiracy means in Latin, conspire, it means to breathe together, right? And think about what that means, right? Now, we're not allowed to do that, like the COVID prevents us from conspiring. We're not, and of course, Zoom is watching, so we're all permanently under surveillance all the time. Um, did, are we paranoid yet? <laughs> okay, um, but in a sense then, Right, conspiracy is, in my sense, three interrelated interlocking horizons. A conspiracy is a criminal act, it is a political plot, and it can be a theory of history. And so when we think about the great conspiracy theories of American history, they usually start on one of these horizons and then bleed out into the other two. So Dallas, Texas, November 22nd, 1963, John F. Kennedy is murdered in the streets of Dallas. It is a crime, it is a criminal act that quickly evolves intellectually into a series of arguments of political plots of the CIA, of uh, the mafia, of others who wanna whack the president, who wanna kill the president, which rapidly grows into a kind of conspiracy theory about how the deep state or the secret state or um, has um, wields political power and wanted to eliminate John F. Kennedy because he was gonna pull out of Vietnam and the military industrial complex wanted that war. And so they murdered their own commander in chief, right? And besides, how could one guy, one loser, Lee Harvey Oswald impact and alter American history so demonstrably when clearly his aim uh, was terrible when he was one of the worst shots in the Marine Corps. Now this is the Kennedy assassination conspiracy theory, but then you, you take Watergate most popular conspiracy of the second half of the 20th century that began with this, what, what Nixon called the third rate burglary in which a number of Republicans were arrested breaking into the DNC headquarters at the Watergate Hotel, which rapidly spiraled into a political plot that brought down uh, President Richard Nixon. Now, on the flip side though, what we have with something like QAnon, I'll come to them in a moment, is a lot of, of people who then come at this from a theory of history. QAnon comes at this question with a theory of history that there are these elites, these secret cabals that, that pull the strings to which this world dances and that they are actively manipulating the world. And so if you have this conspiratorial vision of how history happens, then you go looking for political plots that prove that this is the case. And then you go looking for crimes that prove the political plot that provide evidence for the historical uh, the theory of history. And thus you go from right a theory of history that says there is uh, this secret cabal rules the world, that they are run by Democrats who have child molesting um, uh, cabals that are, that are operating out of the basement of a pizza parlor in Washington, DC, that leads some gun-toting nut from North Carolina to show up at Comet Ping Pong in Washington, DC, looking for a basement in which John Podesta and, um, and Hillary Clinton are molesting children. So you start with a, conspir a theory of history and go looking for a crime. And so we can understand conspiracies in this multiple layered way, right? As crimes, as political plots, and as a theory of history that may or may not disappear into essentially um, high-end um, surreal fantasy, which is, I think, by and large, where we are.
Now, conspiracy theories are indeed really attractive and necessary, and in a certain sense, because the world is, in fact, so complex. And the theoretician um, uh, Frederick Jameson, the Marxist uh, literary critic Frederick Jameson, is one of the great thinkers around conspiracy theory, defines conspiracy thinking as a kind of what he calls cognitive mapping. And he defines this, he says, conspiracy is the poor person's cognitive mapping. It is a degraded figure of the total logic of late capital, a desperate attempt to represent the system whose failure is marked into the slippage, is marked by the slippage into sheer theme and content. And so what this is, is the understanding that everyone needs a model of how the world works, right? Ideology. Conspiracy theory is a form of ideology. It is a narrative, it is a story we tell ourselves about how power operates and what role power plays in our lives. And it helps us map out the social system. Now that mapping is always going to fail, but it's gonna fail in ways that become knowable, articulatable, critiquable, understandable. Conspiracy theories are one of the most popular and populist of these forms of mapping a political reality. And so we come to something like QAnon. QAnon, you know, we, we know who Q is, um, there's uh, someone who was already in the chat. There's a great reply all, uh, 166 uh, a reply all. It's a podcast. I highly recommend it. It was basically the inventor of 8chan, uh, the group of people who invented 8chan and who, who came to own 8chan, who were, are just, they're, they're online LARPing as the kind of high end, you know, secret agent who's going to drop clues. And what you begin to get quickly out of QAnon is a kind of hyper partisan theory about the, how the deep state operates that puts Donald Trump as the central player in a drama in which Donald Trump is the heroic figure waging a secret war against satanic child molesting Democrats, right? Who um, are using the deep state to wield political power and that Donald Trump is the godlike figure of light waging a war against the darkness, at the, which the darkness found at the center of the state, the Democratic Party, and liberal culture in general. Now, with the defeat of Donald Trump in the 2020 presidential election, it would appear as if both God and his prophet Q have failed. And indeed, Q has not left a drop since November 3rd. Q has effectively disappeared. No one using Q's trip code has left a drop on 8 Kuhn um, which is the new site because HN got shut down after the El Paso shooting. When the El Paso shooting, um, they, they published his uh, manifesto. HN got shut down. A Kuhn has picked it up. Um, their most popular site, um, QAnon, has disappeared. And this is leaving millions, literally millions of people around the world utterly bereft. Not only has their God Donald Trump failed, but their prophet Q has disappeared on them. And we're seeing a phenomenon on the right akin to a doomsday cult whose end of the world date has come and gone without the world, without the fire and brimstone. And those left over in the cult are either searching for a new date, searching for a new deity, searching for a new sense of meaning, or they are awakening from this conspiratorial slumber and shattered by the reality that has crashed down upon them. But it is important to recognize, right, quite clearly that Trump and his organization have always been grounded in conspiracy theories. I mentioned this at the beginning with the birther movement, where Trump really found his, uh, his legs politically, which has then led to, um, uh, uh, led to things like, you know, to Trump building his um, coalition out of increasingly paranoid, conspiratorially attached right-wing white people, right? White male voters became an essential component of his constituency. White female voters became an essential component of his constituency. So too did the growing ranks of the alt-right, the alternative right that emerged really during the, the, the late years of the Obama era to emerge to become the kind of voice of the sort of we're not Nazis far right, even though most of them actually end up being quite sympathetic to Nazis. Now, these are photographs that I took. These are all my pictures 
uh, from Civic Center in Berkeley on April 19th when Ann Coulter was supposed to come to Cal, but because she didn't get paid her $30,000 speaking fee, she decided not to show up. But all of these right-wingers who were paid to come receive free bus tickets from Orange County. I talked to people who had been paid to arrive there all the way from Colorado, from Oregon, from Orange County and elsewhere. Now, as you will notice, I am white. You see, I am white. So I can go amongst these people and talk to them. Whiteness is my passport. So I went and talked to these people and I asked them, can I take your picture? Hey, what does that symbol mean on your shirt? What is that, the three, the three percenter, the, the oath keepers, the, uh, the proud boys, what, what is the, what, who are you? What does this mean, right? All of this stuff, I mean, lit, they, you know, all of these, these things. That, and then I got a substance, I found a substantive subset of Palo Alto tech bros who were also there quite convinced that liberalism is some kind of diseased pathology that is infecting the youth. Now, these were all down at Civic Center. They were actively fighting with Berkeley High School students, which I thought was quite fascinating. But I will tell you that to a man, all of these people thought they were on the Berkeley campus. <laughs> I was not going to disabuse them of that idea, let alone tell them who I am, because I am the fantasy that they all have of what a Berkeley professor is, right? The Jew who riles up um, people of color, right? That's their fantasy of me, I, I, AKA the trolls in the comment section of the YouTube page, right? These are the same people. This was April 19th. 2017, we saw these people actually dominate um, American, come to the center of American politics later uh, in the summer on August 12th, 2017 um, at Charlottesville, Virginia, followed the next day by the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, in which neo-Nazis, Klansmen, Proud Boys, um, and members of the alt-right attempted, and armed militias attempted to come together to hold a rally in defense of the Confederate monuments scheduled to be taken down in Virginia. Now, this was, of course, the moment in which Donald Trump called the people, these people, uh, very fine people. And I think that this photograph here, uh, this is my, I think, the most telling photograph uh, from Charlottesville, because it reveals, in a sense, um, where we are as a nation, in which anti-fascist organizers at the top of the frame are confronting fascist organizers at the bottom of the frame. And American liberalism is a thin piece of plastic decorated with rainbows and a slogan attempting to keep these people apart, utterly incapable of being heard or effective in the increasing war um, that Americans are waging on each other. Now we know how the Unite the Right uh, rally ended with the murder of anti-racist activist Heather Hare, um, the, the sort of martyr of this moment. And um, Unite the Right ended in com really incomplete failure. It broke apart. The right, the right was not united. It, uh, it crumbled uh, and Trump took a, a huge hit by trying to defend these people. Now this has remained a long sort of undercurrent for a long time um, until, and has then reemerged in a certain sense. It was submerged and then reemerged um, with the murder of George Floyd and the explosion of the Black Lives Matter protests. The right wing was quite defeated by this. They took a kind of backstage position um, and, and were overwhelmed. This is why we call them reactionaries, because they react to events. They're not leading events, they're reacting. So when millions and millions, tens of millions of Americans came out and protested the murder of George Floyd, it took the right several weeks to get their act together, to mobilize and begin to push, particularly in the form of defensive police violence and the, the rise of the Blue Lives Matter flag. Now, this flag was invented in 2014. 14 by some right-wing kid, I think, in, Minis in Wisconsin or Minnesota. And it is this kind of uh, the, the, the draining of the U.S. flag of its multicolored nature. The red, white, and blue are drained away, right? What is left is a flag that is black and white with a thin blue line in which a white stripe is replaced with a blue stripe. Right, with a black stripe above and a black stripe below. And the black people, the, the stripes above are those that follow the law, and the predominantly black stripes below are those that are in contravention of the law who must be held in check by the thin blue line. Trump has ad increasingly adopted this flag during the campaign. And what you see here is a Trump rally in Waukesha, Wisconsin, in which the thin blue live flag hangs above the entire um, uh, crowd. And so when, with this kind of politics brewing, it should have surprised no one when we see police assault um, people here uh, in Alamance County, North Carolina, in which black folks attempting to march to the polls in a sanctioned 
permitted march are attacked and tear gassed by police attempting to prevent black people from voting, right? Um, as we see here, in fact, they, they tear gassed a three-year-old child so as to prevent her parents from being able to vote uh, in North Carolina. We see then, again, fueled equally by conspiracy theories and white supremacy, we saw during the campaign Donald Trump embrace a vigilante attempt to, we don't know what, but attack essentially a Biden-Harris campaign bus in Texas on October 31st to where Trump could post this and we, you know, we get the... Three, two, one, go! Welcome to the... So this is Donald Trump with music and video endorsing vigilante intimidation of the Biden-Harris campaign in Texas, right? Openly endorsing white power violence against his political opponent. So already we are in a dangerous place. Now, this of course became very popular on the internet, um, particularly amongst sort of liberals who are like, start, you know, like, oh, look, you know, here's a bunch of tr Republicans in trucks. Um, you know, and they start calling them, you know, Yal Qaeda, Vanilla ISIS, uh, and things like this to depict um, Trump supporters as uh, foreign Islamic terrorists. This is naive, dangerous, and wrong. Why do we need to compare these people to foreign terrorists when there's a long and readily available history of American terrorism? to which these people find themselves in complete agreement and direct alignment. There's very little difference between, you know, and I'll give you, there's very little difference between what we saw in Texas and what we see in D.W. Griffith's 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, in which white Klansmen rise up in vigilante violence against African-American voters and an African-American elected officials in a recreation of the Civil War and Reconstruction from 1915. This is not Yal Qaeda. This is not vanilla ISIS. This is just the run of the mill white supremacist vigilantism that has always been a deep strain in American political life. Why compare these people to foreigners when they're readily available terrorist equivalents that these people are clearly directly in line with. And indeed, right, between 1915 and 2020, the parallels are pretty exact. And I would just simply add that, you know, Woodrow Wilson's imprimatur given to Birth of a Nation is very much akin to Donald Trump retweeting um, images of vigilante violence that we saw uh, in Texas, in Wisconsin, and elsewhere. The one key difference, and I think the totality of American political history can be summarized in the fact that the one key difference between Birth of a Nation in 1915 and Donald Trump's I love Texas tweet of 2020 is that the vigilantes in 1915 were Democrats and in 2020 they're Republicans. And so we should not be surprised then. In Detroit, we see white mobs outside the counting center in Wayne County demanding that right white voter white mobs telling black people to stop counting the votes of black voters this is not surprising this is absolutely in line with american history right and we see black folks counting votes counting the votes of black people white mobs assembled outside to try and stop the vote and so we similarly then see quite clearly the million maga march which happened this weekend in which Proud Boys and a number of other organizations came together to march through DC to um, engage in violence. Indeed, three people were hospitalized uh, with stab wounds, including a journalist uh, was stabbed by a Proud Boy uh, on Saturday. Uh, and we see quite clearly, this, these are Proud Boys here, you know, Proud Boys Keep America Great Again, uh, offering the white supremacist symbols. So if there ever was a question, right, these are the people that Donald Trump told to stand back and stand by. And and now they have emerged to defend their man. And so while the Unite the Right rally in 2017 fractured the American right, what we're seeing now in the wake of Donald Trump's refusal to um, uh, concede this election is a recoalescence of the far right behind Donald Trump himself 
and the Republican Party in general. They are rapidly becoming the party of the vigilante terrorist right. And this, I think, is the real fear that most of us have. Indeed, you can see this, like, talking to you reminds me to clean my gun, black rifles matter, all of that kind of language. But I think perhaps the most chilling, most central in all of this is what I saw on Fox on Saturday, which was this sign that was being carried by somebody at the Million MAGA March that said, coming for Blacks and Indians first, welcome to the New World Order. This makes it absolutely plain who these people are, what their political goals are, and where they think they're going. And indeed, this is the oldest problem we have in American democracy. And I think I, I probably began this class uh, with W.B. Du Bois, and so I want to end it here as well. This is, again, Du Bois's masterpiece, um, Black Reconstruction, in which he writes, quote, the true significance of slavery, the true significance of slavery in the United States to the whole social devel development of America lay in the ultimate relation of slaves to democracy. What were to be the limits of democratic control in the United States? If all labor, black as well as white, became free, were given schools and the right to vote, what control could or should be set to the power and action of these laborers? Was the rule of the, ma of the mass of Americans to be unlimited and the right to rule extended to all men, regardless of race and color? Or if not, what power of dictatorship would rule and how would property and privilege be protected? This was the great and primary question which was in the minds of the men who wrote the Constitution of the United States and continued in the minds of thinkers down through the slavery controversy. It still remains with the world as the problem of democracy expands and touches all races and nations. Du Bois then goes on to explain that the force that he is supporting, that he stands behind, is what he calls abolition democracy. The belief that a democratic force can bring about the abolition of slavery. And that abolition democracy squared off against the history of American white supremacy. And we find ourselves in exactly that moment now, in which we are confronted by an organized force of white power that operates in contravention to and above the legal authority of the state and the desire of the American people for a multiracial democracy, a reconstruction of our democracy. We are faced with, quite simply, a fight between democracy and the white republic, between white power and abolition, between a far-right minoritarian movement and the overwhelming majority of Americans of all races, genders, and identities. And the one thing that I do know, uh, that is all of us um, are invested in, that will continue, and that sorrow, I am, I am sure, will take up and push to a conclusion, is we will not stop. The cause of a multiracial democracy goes on. The fight um, continues because, quite simply, our lives depend on it. All right. Thank you. I know, I'm sorry I went on for too long there, Sorrow. You know, you know I, have, I have things to say. <laughs> no <laughs> um, worries. I'll turn this over to you, please. OK, so um, we want to move now from white men to black women. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, literally, this is what I wanted to talk about today. Oh, man. Can you see my screen? The Black Women Who Flipped Georgia. Um, I want to uh, thank you, Professor Cohen. That was super helpful and really good context. Um, and I think it lays out what we have to be worried about. And then what I want to talk about is, I think, what we have to be hopeful about. Um, and where we go from here. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I mentioned to you guys last week, I believe that um, it took the, it took, you know, CNN and others, Pelosi and others in the Democratic Party, literally seconds to move from we won to this was not a vindication for progressives, quote unquote progressives. This is about moving to the center. Um, but nobody could deny that something extraordinary had happened in the state of Georgia, um, led by black women. And on those same networks, they kept talking about 
these organizers, these organizers. And it's funny because people na have named Stacey Abrams, have credited Stacey Abrams for a lot of what happened in Georgia, but they keep talking about these organizers, these women of color organizers in Georgia, in Arizona, in Pennsylvania. So in Georgia, I thought it would be really important for us to actually say their names rather than just calling them organizers. There, this is not even a, uh, this is not even the full list, but I did want to spend some time talking about what these women did to flip this state that has been red and Republican for a long, long time. That is the only state in the South so far to flip in the Southeast to, to flip in this way. What did they do? How did they do it? Um, it was not traditional Democratic Party, uh, you know, mechanisms. It was not following the advice of the traditional Democratic Party pundits, um, many of whom, honestly, some of whom share some of the same, even if they would never say it, white supremacist beliefs that Professor Cohen talked about on the right. There is a real uh, white supremacy, patriarchy, and neoliberalism on in the Democratic Party that has stopped women like these women that I'm gonna talk about right now from actually letting their wisdom lead the way. And thank God in Georgia, the Democratic Party, traditional Democratic Party had to step aside when Stacey Abrams came through, but it, even she will say it was not just me. Um, and I, you know, I, I want to name these folks. I know a lot of these folks. Uh, they are incredible organizers and they've been working on this in Georgia for a decade or more. Um, so Stacey Abrams, you know, uh, has been the minority leader in the, in, the Georgia, in the Georgia legislature. She ran for governor and in my opinion won, um, but was cheated out of the election. And we'll talk more about this by the secretary of state who was running against her and controlled his own election. Latasha Brown is this incredible organizer who started Black Voters Matter, which is a national organization, um, but also the New Georgia Project uh, has been, you know, an incredible organization that Stacy helped to co-found that really registered tens of thousands of people and so on and so forth. I'm going to actually go through several of these organizations and people in a minute because I think it's so important for, we're, we're teaching an elections class and in the middle, I talked to you about social movements. And we talked a little bit about the intersection between social movements and electoral politics. But nothing so beautifully explains the most effective ways in which social movement organizing led by that multiracial coalition that Professor Cohen just talked about can actually be the most effective way to win electoral politics. More effective than the people who've been doing electoral politics for decades the old way. This is the new way, and it is deeply tied to organizing, issue organizing, and social movements. Um, and it is networked. It is not one person, one leader, one candidate. It is many organizations working together. This is what happens when women and women of color lead. They don't uplift one person. Yes, they'll have their leaders like Stacy and Lucy McBath, who, um, as you all know, won a House seat, actually won Newt Gingrich's house, house seat out of Georgia. Um, yes, there will be leaders, but everybody will tell you among these organizers, it was all about working together, the network, understanding that we are stronger together, we're a coalition, and we can get this done. So before we say how they did it, I think uh, the fact, I mean, a lot of people did recognize that they were responsible for this election. Um, this is Pramila J. Paul, who leads the Progressive Caucus in Congress, saying whatever happens in Georgia, everyone should get on their knees and thank strong black women like fearless Stacey Abrams and so many who slog away without appreciation, which is why I wanted to say their names. And then we should pass real policies that benefit them. This may all come down to Georgia and Arizona. I wanna just highlight this one part of her sentence, we should pass real policies that benefit them because again, one of the things that these women organizers know is that A, getting people out to vote was about issues, not about candidates. And then if it was about issues, if we don't deliver on those issues now, um, God help us in the next election. 
This is Ben Wickler, who um, used to lead Move On and and has been the head of the Democratic Party in Wisconsin, saying there's a lot of totally correct talk about how how Stacey Abrams was pivotal to winning Georgia. Folks, Stacey and her team were pivotal to flipping Wisconsin too and every other battleground. They worked with us to build massive supercharged voter protection teams starting early. So the wisdom they brought, the different way of doing things in Georgia was not limited to Georgia. It helped battleground states nationwide. How did they do it? The first thing they did was recognize a decade ago that Georgia's demographics were starting to change. Nearly two, the New Georgia Project, which Stacy started, helped to start, uh, reports that nearly 2 million people have moved to Georgia over the last decade and over 80% of them are people of color. They are younger, they are more diverse. They, there's a growing immigrant population. And there's a lot of folks in, in this reverse great migration, African-Americans returning to the South and in particular to Atlanta. Atlanta and the Atlanta suburbs have been a real place where a lot of people have come back to in the thousands. And Rockdale County is an example of that. This is an Atlanta suburb that in 2000 was 18% African-American. And this year in January was reported to be 55% African-American. In the middle of that uh, 20 year period in 2012, as the county started to turn more black, majority black, a slate of eight, um, these were local you know, board and city council, uh, you know, local elected officials replaced an all Republican majority in the, in the county elected official world. And so you saw even at the local level, politics starting to shift as a result of demographic change. And in addition to more and more people of color, younger, more diverse, more immigrants moving to the suburbs, it's also true that the suburbs have grown more populous while rural counties have declined. You know, as I was preparing for this last night, I remembered that I, I taught food policy for many years and the history of I'm sure you all, I mean, many of you will know the history of um, farming and agriculture in this country is that the right, I mean, it wasn't just the right, it was just neoliberal policy. There was a very intentional move to get people out of farms and into cities and out of, you know, get them off the farm, you know, get them off the farm, get them into cities, have them work for low wage work. And that has been an ongoing, you know, since 50 years ago, when that was a very intentional program, that has been an ongoing phenomenon of people leaving rural areas, leaving farms, you know, de population decline in rural areas as Atlanta suburbs have grown more populous. So in some ways that neoliberal program hurt the right in that these rural counties have declined in population just as Atlanta suburbs are becoming more diverse as people are moving back to them, people of color are moving back to them and they're growing more populous at the same time. So 10 years ago, Stacey Abrams and many of these other women in Georgia saw this demographic change, which had started really in 2000, started to get more and more. So about 10 years ago, they said, there is a new Georgia on the way. They recognized this a decade ago. And they said, there's a new Georgia on the way we can flip the state if we engage new voters in these changing suburbs, if we protect their access to the polls because they were already starting to see pretty horrific voter suppression of people of color 10 years ago. And most importantly, if you give them a reason to vote, what does that mean? You don't just say this candidate is so great, he's gonna be better than the other candidate or this candidate is so bad, you really don't want him. No, you say your wages are going to go up because this elected official has prioritized your wages. Healthcare is going to be, um, is going to be available because this candidate is promising to actually prioritize more universal healthcare. Um, climate change is gonna be addressed. Some of the key issues that communities of color, younger people, growing immigrant populations care about are reasons to vote, issues that are reasons to vote much more so than candidates or parties. And they watched, Stacey Abrams and these other women watched as they were developing this 10-year plan. They watched as Secretary of State Brian Kemp, who then ran for governor and is the current governor, 
purged 1 million voters and enacted this exact match rule where the signature on your voter card has to exactly match the signature on your ballot, otherwise they throw out the ballot. So um, he purged all of these voters, mostly people of color, and in, a, in an attempt, because look, the right was also seeing the demographic change. There are countless press pieces of the right warning of this demo coming demographic change, coming demographic change in Georgia. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. And so in response, they started in 2012 to try to throw out these votes and suppress the votes. And what did the Democrats do at the time in response? They ran centrists for office. Jason Carter, President Jimmy Carter's grandson ran. Um, they ran uh, Ann Nunn, Senator Sam Nunn's uh, daughter. These folks failed miserably over and over again. The Republicans kept winning because centrists were not exciting any new voters or giving anybody a reason to vote. So Stacey Abrams and the crew, these many women, Stacey herself, she had a PowerPoint presentation on the 10-year plan that she's been trying to tell everybody about for the last 10 years. We must engage these new voters in changing suburbs. We must protect their access to the polls and we must give them a reason to vote. And 10 years later, you see the impacts. So in 2016, as this 10-year plan developed, Stacey Abrams founded Fair Fight. This is before she ran for governor um, because they saw that 22% of eligible voters in the state were not registered to vote. So they started registering people to vote and protecting voters' rights. Fair Fight was a network of attorneys uh, actually supporting you know, lawsuits when people's votes were being suppressed or they were being thrown out off of the voter rolls. Um, so she started this work in 2016. In 2018, of course, she ran for governor. The Secretary of State oversaw his own election and frankly just cheated. He just cheated. People's votes were thrown out. Polling places were mysteriously changed or shut down in Black communities. Um, he just cheated. And um, Lucy McBath, though, it is important to note, in the midst of all of this, uh, a mom whose son had been killed by the police, who made gun reform her issue, won the seat that Newt Gingrich had held for 20 years in Georgia, um, which was a huge win for Democrats in Georgia and, and in the House. So clearly Stacy's work and the work of these women over 10 years was having an impact, even if Brian Kemp still cheated. Finally, in 2020, you know, everybody talked, people talked to Stacey about running for Senate, doing so many things, but she decided to focus on, you know, she said, nobody's going to win in Georgia as long as we don't take care of this 10-year plan of engaging new voters, protecting voters' access to the polls, and giving them a reason to vote. So that's what she focused on. They went in 2020 um, from 22% eligible voters not registered to vote to 2% of eligible voters not registered to vote. They registered 20% of eligible voters in, in this year. It is that, I mean, if anybody who's ever done voter work in a state, that is, that is an enormous feat to register that number of people. Um, and they had a 67% turnout rate in Georgia that broke a 40 year record in Georgia. And, and look, there was there was the highest record turnout across the country. I mean, Georgia was part of an overall wave of record turnout this year, but but there's just no comparison. Georgia had a higher registration and turnout rate than all other battleground states. It is so important to note that they won in this new way of doing things, which I want to explain now. How is it new? How is it different? And I want to go through each of these and talk about the women who made this happen. So Georgia Stand Up, a black led women, a black women led organization. If you go back to my list here, um, it was, it's Georgia Stand Up is led by Deborah Scott. I'm gonna go through each of these so you know who these people are and their organizations and what they did. So Georgia Stand Up calls itself a think and act tank for working communities, working on housing, transit and voter engagement. At first, they were just doing voter registration online, but with the pandemic, they started just seeing just massive need among people. And so they started doing voter registration at food giveaways and food banks, at COVID-19 testing centers, at the racial justice protests. They started their own food giveaways. Um, and then 
they launched a huge early voting program where they drove around with, in vans with food and water and necessities. They started doing outdoor parties at polling locations with DJs and street performers that started drawing people to these early voting polling locations, um, which was very, very different than the, again, the traditional Democratic Party way of doing things. Working Families Party. Working Families Party is a national organization. It is not technically another, it is not technically a third party. It is a party that runs um, kind of, they call them fusion candidates, candidates who are both Democrats and Working Families Party candidates. Um, and so they run progressive candidates who support progressive issues like the minimum wage and climate change and other labor issues. It was started by labor folks. And they did run these progressive candidates from school boards all the way up and down the ticket. But in Georgia, they also work closely with Sunrise and the Movement for Black Lives and Rising Majority to really shift the election. So you had one group doing all this non-traditional voter registration. You had one group running progressive, all run by black women. Uh, all of these organizations I'm, lead, I'm talking about, um, uh, one group running progressive candidates up and down uh, the ballot. The Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda was engaged in civic participation, voter registration, civic education. They did a massive amount of voter registration. And they also had these, they call them Tuesday afternoon meetings, which turned into candidate fora, where they would bring candidates, again, up and down the ticket. And they'd have at least 50 to 100 people in each of these meetings. And they would start connecting elections to people's everyday lives. And the leader of the Coalition for the People's Agenda talks about how you know, if you don't, again, you have to give people a reason to vote, particularly younger people, growing communities of color, immigrant voters. And so connecting the elections and voting to what people were really worried about at the moment was, was their contribution to getting a lot more people registered. Latasha Brown uh, is a friend of mine who runs Black Voters Matter. It's a national group founded in 2016 to build Black political power. Um, if they've been supporting Black voter registration and civic engagement all over the country. In Georgia, they really threw down and provided funding and coordination for over 40 grassroots groups, including helping them purchase voter files, which are really expensive, and systems to do like Call Hub and other text messaging systems. And one of the things Latasha talks about is that the groups on the ground that they funded, as opposed again to the traditional Democratic Party way of doing things, were not just running TV ads. In fact, they weren't running TV ads at all because they couldn't afford them. They were the ones doing on the ground work in the communities, talking to people, again, connecting the election to the issues that mattered most to communities of color. Then the Southwest, Southwest Georgia project for community education is really interesting because Southwest Georgia is a more rural part of the state. And this organization focused on tying the elections to food security and issues facing family farmers and their civic engagement in Southwest Georgia. They were doing grassroots organizing and voter canvassing. They relied on a network of attorneys from Fair Fight, Stacey Abrams organization, and Latasha's organization, Black Voters Matter and the Working Families Party to address any individual voter problems that came up. And they have said that for them in Southwest Georgia, very rural part of the state, the network that was created of these Black women led organizations was key. Cooperation among all the groups was so key to ensuring that uh, if they were doing the voter registration and they ran into somebody whose name had been taken off the voter file, they could call Fair Fight or any one of these other organizations to get representation. Pro-Georgia, another, another statewide coalition of about 30 grassroots groups, including labor unions, that was tying voter registration and again, issue organizing. Issue organizing means organizing around raising the minimum wage, organizing around health care, organizing around reproductive rights, organizing around the issues that people care about in their everyday lives, tying voter registration to that. And they registered 100,000 voters over the last six years by embedding the voter registration into the everyday work of these grassroots groups, including English as a second language classes for immigrants. Um, you know, there were clinics that they brought them to. There were, again, food giveaways. If there were programs that these grassroots groups were running, they would bring the voter registration into them. And to me, to, and, and the director talks about how we want, we need to make voter registration a part of everyday work, not being transactional. Transactional is the key word that a lot of organizers use to, to 
um, critique the traditional way of doing voter work. Voter work in the past led by the Democratic, traditional Democratic Party has been transactional. That transactional means uh, I'm gonna come out and talk to you about you doing something for me, which is voting, just vote. We just need you to vote. We don't actually care about you after you vote. We don't care about you for the next four years, just vote. But for these organizations, they weren't coming in from outside. They weren't talking to people just about voting. They were organizations that had been with members that they've been talking to for years and years and years. They were folks who were running English classes for years. They were folks who were running, organizing around various issues for years. So they made voter registration a part of the work, a natural outgrowth of the conversations and relationship building they were already doing. And then the New Georgia Project um, led by Inse Ufat that uh, Stacey Abrams helped to start nonpartisan effort to register and civically engage thousands of Georgians. And they ended up registering 800,000 voters. They were focused on BIPOC communities and youth. And they did all kinds of things to keep voters entertained. They created a video game on Twitch and they had celebrities get on the video game and on Twitch to talk about the importance of voting. Um, they did all kinds of creative things like, you know, they had to they had to be ready for the shenanigans of the right. So on election day at 5 a.m., November 3rd, uh, it was announced <laughs> in Georgia that 100 polling places were changed. So New Georgia Project went out to these 100 polling places, the original spots with sandwich boards to tell voters to go to the new, where they could go to the new spot. So they had to be, the thing about this network is they worked together, they shared information, they were cooperative, not competitive. They were focused on issues that mattered most to people. They gave people a reason to vote and they were ready for the shenanigans of the right. They were ready for these kinds of, let's shut down this place and send people somewhere else in, in the right's attempt to repress votes. So they were ready, they had been ready for 10 years. And so what happened as a result? What happened? Georgia had historic turnout. As you can see, we went, Georgia went from 22% eligible but not registered in 2016 to 2% eligible but not registered. That's out of a population of more than 7.3 million people. That is extraordinary, extraordinary. And you could see they went from 2016 to 2020, 59% voter turnout to 67% voter turnout. So huge voter turnout, huge, huge work to get everybody registered. I mean, just an extraordinary accomplishment. And then this is from the Washington Post, which noted that the, that, you know, what one, for, you know, Democrats haven't won Georgia since Bill Clinton in 1992. Um, in 96, and that you can see that, uh, that I'm sorry, not, not in 96, only in 92. As you can see from these dots, which are population centers, you can, the circles you can see at the top are the differences in votes between first and second place in each county. All of those blue dots, which were more rural areas that went for Clinton in 1992, obviously shifted over time, became more and more red and it really ended up being the Atlanta suburbs, Columbus, Savannah, these urban areas where black people had returned, people of color had returned, growing immigrant populations, youth, younger voters were coming into these, into these, not just the cities themselves, but the suburbs surrounding the cities that really changed uh, what ended up winning um, Georgia for Biden. Uh, and so this is just more of the same, that really the votes for Biden came from Atlanta and its suburbs in large, large numbers. So what are the lessons of this? Um, Stacey Abrams says, I think where the Democratic Party has gotten into trouble is that we've created a binary, whether it's either the normative voter we remember fondly from 1960, AKA the white working class man, or it's the hodgepodge, meaning everybody. The reality is that we are capable as a society of having multiple thoughts at the same time. What does that mean? Sure, go work on, if you want to, winning back that white working class voter, but there is a multiracial coalition of folks, as Professor Cohen mentioned, that is frankly growing in demographics and just needs to be given a good reason to vote um, for 
in their own interests for uh, the issues that matter to them the most. This Inse Ufad of New Georgia majority saying that organizing is the accelerant that has pushed this along and that it's not about a candidate. It's never been about a candidate. It's about long-term investment in people and infrastructure. In other words, the way they won was not about talking about Joe Biden and not even talking about Donald Trump. It was about talk, it was about long-term relationships these folks had built with thousands of people in their communities all over Georgia, all over the Atlanta suburbs and growing metropolitan areas in Georgia, even in Southwest Georgia and rural Georgia, long-term relationships where they had been organizing around issues that mattered and then talking to people about how voting and organizing are connected. Winning on these issues is connected. And lastly, when you're trying not only to harness demographic changes, but leverage low propensity voters, you cannot simply hope that they'll hear the message. You have to treat them as persuasion voters. Only the message is not trying to, only the message is not trying to persuade them to share democratic values. Your message is to persuade them that voting can actually yield change. What does that mean? So again, the Democratic Party has for so long focused on high propensity voters, likely voters, again, white, mostly white people or people who are, have a tendency to already vote. They're gonna focus on them. They're going to you know, focus on their donors who tend to be also white, wealthier people. Uh, they were so worried about the white working class man in particular after 2016. And they either took, took for granted communities of color or you know, assuming that they would vote the right way or uh, they just ignored them, they just ignored them. And what Stacy is saying is that, look, demographic change is key. Demographic change could be the future of our country, but it's not gonna actually change politics as we saw in Florida, unless you actually provide, you, you think of these voters as persuasion voters, meaning you've got to think of them. It's not just that a, a city or a, or a metropolitan area turns more black as you heard from Alicia Garza, you know, that's not enough. <laughs> that's not enough because people can be persuaded towards conservative values, even people of color, uh, if they're not treated with dignity and respect and long-term relationships are developed. So the message to persuade, you can take advantage of demographic change, but only if you can persuade people in places where demographics are changing that voting can actually yield change that the people you're asking them to vote for will actually deliver for them on the issues that matter to them the most. So the hopefulness for me, for me of the future is that Stacey Abrams is seriously being considered for the chair of the Democratic Party. That would be a groundbreaking, you know, like just a, earth shattering change in the future of the Democratic Party. Because again, we can continue the old school Democratic Party thinking of focusing on the white working class or more likely focusing on donors, focusing on hyper propensity voters, doing transactional work, just getting people out to vote every four years. We can do that and then moving on to a neoliberal agenda without delivering for the people who delivered the election or we can listen to Stacey, see what she and the black women in Georgia did, which it, it wasn't just, it wasn't just the right thing to do for God's sakes, I hope people see it was the more effective thing to do. It actually was the only attempt in the last 40 years to flip a Southern state that succeeded. The only one, the only one. Democrats in their wisdom have not flipped any democratic state in the South. It took black women in the South to say, we've got to do this differently. We've got to engage in organizing. We've got to talk to people and listen and talk about the things that they care about the most. And then for God's sakes, deliver. For God's sakes, deliver. So um, if she were to become the head of the Democratic Party, I think you'd see a very different kind of organizing, kind of voter engagement, kind of partnership with groups on the ground, grassroots organizers, um, a very different world for 2022, 2024, 
And that is the hope that I have and I leave this class with that, um, that we, you, the next generation, you can help us reshape politics so that we are not stuck with two parties stuck in a neoliberal um, mindset, that we actually have a party that represents working people, people of color, and the new growing multiracial feminist, uh, really kind of uh, pro uh, climate justice coalition that we need for the future. <laughs> Um, that was amazing. Thank you. Outstanding. What questions do you have for us? You know, your second to last shot here. This is, I, my, my, I, I, all the things that Sarah described, I, I think, are essential to understanding what's happened in Georgia. I also think that there's a parallel case to be made about what happened in Arizona as well. And I think this is the kind of fascinating uh, exploration that Anna and Karen gave us a few weeks ago or last week, uh, you know, about what's going on in Arizona. I, I, I think that part of the demographic shift also is, in a sense, is that. Um, Arizona and Georgia flipped because New York and California are too expensive. And people have been leaving New York and leaving California for decade now because it's too expensive to live here and have been moving to Atlanta and to Phoenix and to Tucson and to these places. And so, and they bring, um, you know, an open mind. They bring um, liberal voting, democratic voting patterns, liberal sensibilities with them. Uh, that's been part of the shift as well. But the the organizing on the ground is is essential. And I have to I have to believe like if 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 Georgia delivers two Senate races in this runoff, uh, Stacey Abrams is getting there. There's no way they could keep her out of that job. Um, okay, let's. Uh, um, Min, you want to? Let me. I'll go ahead and uh, get you to ask your first question. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the amazing lecture today to both of you. Um, my question is, what would the path for the Democratic Party's leadership to change look like? Like we've been talking about how we want to have the leadership to change, but how would that process actually look like? Uh, I, I, sorry, go, you probably know the answer to this better than I do. I mean, the, the, the head of the DNC gets put up for renomination, re-election every few years. And so this is a natural fallout of presidential election cycles, or it's part of the process. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Some more it's detail. a pretty closed process. It's not like all Democrats in the country get to vote on the head of- We don't get to vote on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the electors and a lot of people, you know, it's a, it's a fairly closed process among Democratic Party kind of leaders. Um, I know uh, in the last cycle, uh, I was supporting Keith Ellison, who ended up uh, becoming the AG of Minnesota. He was a congressman who was more progressive. Uh, Tom Perez, who was the head of the Department of Labor in Obama's first term, ended up becoming the head of the party and led the party back into this very conservative, uh, more conservative way of doing things. Now, even though we all can't vote in the process, it's fairly closed among these you know, folks that have power in the Democratic Party, we certainly as people can weigh in on everything. You know, my belief that I think we have the power to weigh in. And I'm going to say it again, because I've said it throughout the semester, people in the streets demanding change on issues like climate change and um, minimum wage and health care, that is what is going to have an impact on who the Democratic Party picks. Because if they think we've all just breathed a sigh of relief and backed off as we did during the Obama years, we're gonna get a Tom Perez. But if we're out in the streets demanding change, if there's the kind of level of activity we saw like this summer on, all, on a wide range of issues, it will be much harder for the Democratic Party to select somebody that is so out of touch with the rest of the country. So our, we can organize, we can mobilize, we can call Democratic Party officials to demand that Stacey Abrams, who delivered this election in Georgia, should be named the next chair of the Democratic Party. Right. And if you know any wealthy donors, go lobby them. They're really the ones who, in the end, make these decisions. All right. Let's, uh, Cameron, go ahead. Hi. Th thank you. Um, uh, I actually had um, a question in regards to the comment you just made about Californians and New Yorkers leaving for Wisconsin and, and um, Arizona, that sort of thing. Um, sure. I, I want to know, like, how widespread is that phenomenon? Because, like, um, I actually have like a counterexample um, in Texas. Um, te uh, um, people have been saying that Texas is going to flip blue for a while, and um, and I, I'm actually I, I think that that's 
unlikely simply for the, if uh, people keep moving out of California simply for the reason that um, in 2018 during the midterms, uh, at least uh, for the the race with Beto, and, I'm, and I think once we get uh, like better information on the 2020 elections, we'll see a similar trend. But um, despite the fact that Beto and Democrats lost in Texas, he actually won amongst people who were lifelong like Texas natives. And actually what we're seeing in Texas is Texas is being, I think, held red by conservatives leaving California and, and other states to come, to come to Texas because they see it as a sort of conservative bastion. So I, I, I don't know if you have more info on the add on, like what the sort of demographic change internally, like inside the US movement, what that looks like. But I th um, because I, th I think there's also uh, a possibility that some states are being flipped blue, but some are also being flipped red or staying red because of travel and that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's. A, I mean, I think that's a solid read. I mean, it does. It does. It that makes sense to me in a number of different ways. I mean, I think Americans do move around a tremendous amount. I mean, some of you are doing it right now. You know, like college students go. You know, they leave, especially in California. Like there aren't enough colleges and universities in California for everyone. So large numbers of Californians go out of state and they they move to wherever they're going to college and they stay there. Um, some of the migratory patterns that the movement of Black Americans out of New York to Atlanta is very real. It's uh, the, the, for the first time, uh, it was uh, probably five, six years ago, uh, there, was, there was data that showed that there were more black people leaving New York than moving in. Uh, and this is um, you know, the, the difference in some cases between African-Americans and, um, and black immigrants from the Caribbean or Africa or elsewhere. Um, you know, my own in-laws moved from uh, New York uh, African American in laws moved from New York to Atlanta, and which is why I have an authentic Stacey Abrams for governor sign that uh, you know we I brought back. Um, but you're you're probably right about Texas that you know the low taxes and um, right wing government to do attract their own people. Um, and there have been outflows of people from Orange County and elsewhere. I mean, in my own state of Colorado, um, in 1992, a um, hundred plus thousand people from Orange County moved to Colorado after the Rodney King riots. It's the Rodney King riots scared white people so badly that they just fled the state. Um, and within a few years, Colorado had a right-wing governor, had a right-wing state legislature and elected right-wing senators. Um, that has since um, resolved itself by other people, again, Californians, um, and uh, people from the East Coast and elsewhere who, you know, want to wear yoga pants to dinner, which is the style in Colorado, um, have turned the state back to blue. So like these migratory patterns do shift and they don't all move in exactly the same direction. So Cameron, I think your point is well taken. It is well made. Um, I think what we saw, it, we see in Georgia and Arizona um, um, represented the possibility of flipping constituencies as opposed to preserving uh, something uh, otherwise. So you may be right about Texas, time will tell. Can, can I just add that, again, I want to repeat, demographic change is not enough. People right. of color moving to these communities is not enough. You can't assume that people are just going to vote Democrat because they're people of color, um, especially if the Democrats give them nothing to believe in. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it's hard work. It isn't just democratic ch demographic change. And in Texas, um, there is an amazing other organization that maybe started a little bit later than Stacy's work called Top, a Texas organizing project. They've been leading an incredible statewide effort to flip the state blue for a long time. There's amazing people I could put you in touch with if you're interested in talking to them, but they have been doing this work of, um, you know, not both people of color, building this multiracial coalition of folks that it's younger and more diverse, especially in the metropolitan areas. And I just want to say, I think it's very true that conservative Californians leaving California are going, but they're, when conservative Californians leave California, they tend to go to the whitest, the white, whiter places, not, not places where they're going to find more people of color. So if they're going to Texas, they're not necessarily going to uh, very highly people of color concentrated places. A lot of what conservative Californians are going to Montana, uh, Idaho, um, places Utah. where they can get a lot of land, yes, and be among other white people. White flight is real. All right. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I, dem demographics are not destiny. 
they do provide a playing field, but demographics politically are not destiny. You have to you have to organize folks. I mean that that is a point uh, well made and that but and worth reiterating. So thank you for that, um, uh, Mason. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I have a question to Professor Jayaraman, um, especially with our election twenty twenty group project coming up. Um, I've been thinking a lot about merge left and the race class narrative and the and the necessity for a race class narrative. Uh, now remarking on what you're talking about with voter mobilization in Georgia and in other states, how important are those two ideas and how do they work together? Yeah, I think, I mean, I would say that I think the women in Georgia were using a race class narrative without all the fancy, um, I'm not fancy, but I think Ian clarified something very helpful and that research clarified something very helpful that a lot of these black women organizers knew innately, which is that you have to talk to people about, you know, race and class and the people who are, you know, uh, keeping us apart um, as the key motivator to get people to vote. So I think they're very interconnected and it's helpful to now have a name for it but it's something that these organizers were doing for a long time. Great, all right, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you everybody. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I, um, yes, we, so we, um, we should have a, a, a member of the Berkeley City Council and a former ASUC president uh, who is going to be our last speaker uh, on Wednesday. So we will, you know, um, be talking about local politics, we'll be talking about student politics, we'll be talking about what it actually means to uh, be in governance to one degree or another, um, and, and how one uh, goes from being a, a UC Berkeley student to uh, the, the rather small, but nonetheless significant halls of power in Berkeley City Hall. So uh, I think it should be a really fun way to end this. Um, Rigel's a great, uh, a great uh, fellow. He uh, knows uh, who you all are and you know what, where your, what, what your experience here at Cal is, um, not necessarily the Zoom one, but, um, but all the same, um, it should be a lot of fun. And so I just uh, thank you all for your attention, your time and your uh, brilliant uh, questions and participation. Thank you all. Uh, we will see you all on Wednesday.